Slowly restart. Uh, so in, to introduce the next speaker, we have Thank you, uh, thank you, Lydia. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker of this afternoon session, um, is uh, Felice Apugliese. And um, he's basically finishing his PhD uh, really right now, as we speak. <laughs> and he will present um, a work that is uh, really at the intersection between two different fields, what you see, the optics, and the other one is transport. And as you will see, it's investigating uh, what is the ultimate, uh, if you want, interaction between transport and um, optics, because it's inter interaction between transport and vacuum fluctuations. With that, I will not take more time and leave yes. the word. So, thank you, thank you, Jerome. And I would like to thank you also, the organizers, for inviting me and giving me the possibility to show you my work, and especially Lydia for organizing all the practical aspects. So today I'm going to talk about the breakdown of the topological protection by cavity vacuum fields in the integer quantum mole effect. So first of all, the question is, what is vacuum? So we can understand the concept of vacuum as a region of space where we remove everything. So we remove matter, we remove fields and waves, and what we are left with is pretty much nothing. So <laughs> the existence of vacuum was debated since the very beginning of, human, of mankind, especially from the ancient Greek philosopher, they were debating whether this was possible at all. And for a long time, Aristotle's thesis of nature abhors a vacuum was considered true. So the idea was that matter will try to fill any kind of void by moving. And this was actually believed until the 17th centuries when the first experiment from Pascal and Torricelli showed that it was actually possible so to sustain vacuum. So if you put mercury into a glass tube, it's actually possible to observe at one extremity vacuum. But besides that, also the properties of vacuum were started to be investigated. And people realized soon that sound doesn't propagate in vacuum, but on the other hand, light does. And this brought many people, including Newton, to believe in the existence of a medium, which even, even though was invisible, could not be removed and was carrying light. And this was considered true until the most famous negative experiment of history, which is the Michelson and Morley uh, interferometer, which showed that ether doesn't exist. And only with Einstein's special relativity, people realized that light has a fixed speed, and it doesn't need a medium to be carried. Our concept of vacuum, though, evolved when basically quantum mechanics was birthed. And in particular, in quantum mechanics, we understand that vacuum is not void. One easy interpretation, one pictorial uh, view, is by considering Heisenberg's uncertainty, where we take energy and time. So on a very short time scale in a region of space, it's possible to have fluctuation of energy, which basically is, for a very short time, breaking the conservation of, of energy. And this brings to the concept of uh, space being permeated by virtual particles, which are continuously created and annihilated on a very short time scale. Also, electric and magnetic fields have zero average, average values, but non-zero fluctuations, okay? So non-zero variance. Now, as I said, they cannot be detected directly since they come from nowhere, and being able to measure them will mean that we are actually violating a conservation principle of energy. So the question that we can ask at this point is, if we cannot measure, why do we care? And the reason is there are a number of physical systems where the effects of vacuum fields are visible. And the first one I would like to point out is the spontaneous emission. Now, in this case, we have our electron sitting on an excited state, and because of the interaction with vacuum fields, at some point, this electron is decaying into its ground state. And, for example, for this audience where the target is building quantum computers or qubits, you can imagine that this, well, could be a problem if you want to store information in the upper state, for example. So, 
There are other effects, like the lamp shift, that can only be explained with vacuum, and there are more modern experiments where it was possible to directly detect the effects of vacuum field by exploiting the very high sensitivity of detectors using electro-optic sampling. So, the message here is vacuum is there, and we have to deal with it. But at the same time, vacuum can also be engineered using cavities. And one of the most famous experiment is the Casimir effect, where we bring together two metallic plates and we exploit the fact that a different distribution of vacuum fields inside and outside is generating a net attractive force between the plates. And another very well-known ex example is the Parcel effect, where the uh, spontaneous emission rate is significantly modified by engineering the electromagnetic environment. Now, vacuum fields are important in a lot of extremely sensitive experiments. Even, for example, in the LIGO experiment, where you have this interferometer kilometers long in order to detect gravitational, gravitational waves, when you reach the limit of sensitivity of your system, so you take care of all the residual noise, what you're left with as an art barrier is actually the fluctuations so or the oscillation of um, the electric and magnetic fields. And the knowledge of how this works, so of the fact that, for example, light has an uncertainty principle relating the amplitude and the phase, brought people for an experiment where only the phase matter, to engineer vacuum fields using squeeze states and to basically reduce the phase amplitude and push the, uh, the, the phase noise and push the amplitude noise in a way to increase the overall sensitivity of their system. Now, the question that we can ask ourselves here in this context where the target is to build quantum computers is we operate many quantum computing platform at very low temperature and with very low noise. So, in many cases, these systems are also measured inside metallic cryostat with metallic contacts and gates. And the question I'm asking now is, can vacuum fields be a limitation for those systems? To what extent they can threaten fragile quantum states and to what extent we can ignore or neglect them? So, the strategy of the experiment I will describe now is to take a very robust quantum system, then we will do our best to engineer the cavity vacuum fields in order to enhance the fluctuations, and then we try to understand whether we are able to actually destroy the system or not. Now, what is a prototypical robust system? We all know that for example, if we take a topologically protected system, this is considered a robust system. So topological protection works in this way. Topology is basically the branch of math studying how objects do not change during continuous deformation. So topologically speaking, for example, a mug of coffee can be deformed into a donut without changing its property of having just one hole. It cannot be a Berliner. It cannot be without cutting. In physics, this translates, for example, in the very well-known topological insulators, which are particular states where the bulk is insulating and the conduction happens at the edges. They are protected by symmetry, and hence they are very robust to defects and environmental noise. So, there are several proposals for topological quantum computing platform and also to topologically protect qubits, okay? Our system of election is the integer quantum mole effect, which is a prototypical uh, topologically protected system. So, in the following, what I will do is a short recap of how this works and in what sense we have topological protection in the quantum mole effect. Then I will move to describe our experimental platform, especially focusing on how we can effectively engineer our vacuum fields inside terrace cavities. And eventually, I will describe the results of the experiment where we see how the integer quantum mole effect is modified by the interaction with vacuum fields. Now, let's consider first, to start, what happens when we take a b-dimensional gas of electrons 
and we apply a perpendicular magnetic field. Classically, what happens is that the electrons will start to rotate because of the Lorentz force and form circular orbits. This will have a very specific radius that depends on the applied magnetic field. Quantum mechanically, this system can be mapped into an harmonic oscillator. The levels are known as the Lando levels, and the spacing will be the cyclotron energy. The cyclotron energy has a linear dispersion with magnetic field, so depends linearly on the applied magnetic field. This is how usually the quantum mole effect is, is measured. So we need to cut our two deg in the shape of a bar. We can place contacts, and so we can pass current inside, and we can measure the, vol the longitudinal voltage and the longitudinal resistance, which is also called uh, RL or RXX. And at the same time, we can measure the transverse voltage, which is also known as the whole or transverse voltage or resistance. This is how a typical um, quantum mole trace, an example taken from a graphene device, because this can be done in normal quantum wells, but also in uh, 2D materials, um, looks like. So in the classic case, we see that this trace, which is the longitudinal, so the resistance measure in the direction of the current, is flat at the beginning and normally depends on the disorder of the material. And then at the point where we start seeing the quantum effects shows oscillations. At some point, these oscillations go to these states which are exactly zero. In the whole trace or the transverse resistance, so the one measured if we are passing current in this way, in this direction, what we see is that first we have a linear increase of the resistance with the magnetic field, and then the resistance will reach very specific values which are quantized. What we're interested for the topological protection are the states where we have the zero resistance states and the plateaus. Because those states are usually described by considering the electrons as being of two kinds. So a bulk where we have the cyclonal orbits which are insulating, and then edge states where basically all the conduction is happening. This is a parati paradigmatic topological insulator because it has two characteristics of topological insulator we are interested in. It's the fact that the localized bulk states do not contribute to transport, and there is no backscattering from the chiral 1D edge channels. And we can understand also why this is the case. This is uh, an example took, I took from a uh, Butiker's paper, where basically you see that whenever you have one impurity, the impurity would have to take one electron here and bring it either all the way back to the contact or on the other side of the whole bar. And this is usually not possible because the potential of this impurity is short range. Okay? So what happens is that the electron basically just keep traveling. And this is the reason why we can observe quantum mole effect in a very wide uh, set of geometries and also with very different materials with very different disorder. It's always protected by symmetry. Now, the big question we asked ourselves at some point is, can giant vacuum fields become a threat to this kind of topological protection? So basically, can vac cavity, um, cavity vacuum fluctuation induce an inter-edge coupling? Basically, taking one electron which is sitting on an edge and somehow bringing it to the other edge. The reason why it makes sense to ask ourselves this question is the fact that what we have in this case is the the cavity vacuum field is all over the 2D electron gas, and the topological robustness is not immune to non-local perturbation. Okay, in order to answer this question experimentally, what we need to do is to properly design our cavity in order to enhance the effect of vacuum fields. And this is the cavity we chose, and it's basically a complementary split ring resonator is a pattern sheet of gold where when we apply 
a teller's field, what happens is that we have a localization of the field inside the gap. We have current basically playing the same role as inductors, and this part is basically acting as a capacitor. So it's equivalent to an LC circuit. The advantage of doing that is the fact that the amplitude of the vacuum field scales as the square root of one over the volume of the cavity. And with these specific cavities, what we can have are very sub-wavelength cavity volumes. So we can confine the light on a scale which is 10 to the minus 4, the equivalent Fabry Perot cavity at that wavelength. And this produce strong vacuum fields which are hundreds of times higher than what you get for a Fabry Perot cavity. So this is our system of election. Now, what we have to do is to integrate these in devices which allow also to study transport. And basically, this is the way we realize this. We start by etching the contact structure in a gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide detro structure so that we can pass current through a hole bar and we can measure the longitudinal and the transverse voltage. What is characteristic of this, um, of this uh, setup is the fact that the hole bar is now completely immersed in the vacuum fields of the cavity in the gap of the terrace uh, complementary resonator. This is a cross-section of our sample showing you that if this is the direction of the current flowing in this, which is the two deck, so the bidimensional gas of electrons, we have our uh, capacitor gap which is really sitting on the side of the hole bar and not overlapping with the edges. Now, before showing you the result of our experiment, I just want to recap how the normal quantum hole trace looks like. And especially pointing out two features that I already mentioned is the fact that the transverse resistance is perfectly quantized and only depends on two fundamental constants, which are the Planck's constant and the electron charge. And the longitudinal resistance goes to zero. What is important to notice is the fact that at this point of magnetic field, we are already, already able to distinguish the spin of, we resolve the spin splitting of the electron. So it means that what for um, integer odd filling factors, what we see is the Zeeman gap, while for even filling factors, what we see is the cyclotron gap. So there is this difference. Now, this is the result of our reference hole bar. So a hole bar where we don't place a cavity around. And as you can see, this is pretty textbook. Uh, in the sense we see a very good quantization and zero resistance states. In this particular sense, sample, since it's high mobility, we also see the um, beginning of fractional quantum mole effect uh, around 3 half. Now, when we turn on our cavity, we see that it's fundamentally changing uh, what we observe. And in particular, as the red arrows point out, we observe a breakdown, so we observe basically a collapse of most odd plateaus. And at the same time, in the longitudinal resistance, we see that we release the zero resistance state, and in some cases, we reach even maxima here. One feature that I would like to point out here is the fact that the fractional states are still present, and those have a smaller gap. And usually, the first, those are the first features which are destroyed in very disordered samples. We can also take a look at what happens at low fields, and in particular, at the DC mobility. And this also shows that the overall disorder of our system hasn't changed since the blue trace, which is the cavity, and the black, which is the one without the cavity, perfectly overlap at zero, where we are measuring basically the disorder of the sample. So this means that we're really targeting only some specific states, which for us are the, exactly the states, uh, depending on the integer quantum mole, which are the topologically protected one. But we can go even one step further. In particular, so here I'm showing some pictures of our setup. What we see is our dilution fridge. Here, um, what we have is a stack of um, piezoelectric positioners allowing us to bring a metallic tip in close proximity of 
our terrace resonator so that we can actually modify the near field and basically we can modulate the electromagnetic environment in a controlled way. So we are making a cavity which can also be basically to some extent tuned, okay? So where the distribution of vacuum field can be changed. And I'm showing you here the result. I will explain what we're seeing, but basically what we're seeing is the difference between the resistance we measure when the tip is close, so it's about like 200 nanometer from the surface of the sample, and when it's far, so it's about three micron. The red line here, the dotted line, represents the case of no change. So if we were to measure something that doesn't depend on the position of the tip, we would see just some random noise around zero. But what we see here is actually a very complex structure. In particular, one feature confirming the result I showed you before is the fact that for even states, we are basically have no change, so a bit of fluctuations around zero. But for all states, we have a consistent change both in the longitudinal than in the whole resistance. So the message that I think is relevant for this audience is really the fact that zero point fluctuations of the electric fields affect electronic states. And they can affect even very robust states where topological protection is in place. So also an unintentional enhancement of fields can destroy them. So it really matters when designing the experiment, understanding if you are in the situation like this, where you have like the metrological hole bar, you have very far and probably detuned contacts, and so you can basically neglect the effect of vacuum fields, or if you are in a situation like this, so this is an example from the Majorana uh, particles, where you, know, you have very thin wires with gates going all over, and they're probably a good engineering of uh, antenna-like effect could be relevant. For our experiment, what we are moving now to is the um, idea of being able to more precisely quantify this effect by bringing the cavity on top of a bare hole bar. And this would allow us to really be able to estimate the amount of field which is seen by the hole bar and then quantify the change in resistance. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and then I would like to thank all the people who worked uh, in this project, especially my supervisors, Jean Fais and Giacomo Scalari, and uh, Josephine Enkner, who was the PhD student who worked with me in this. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so the paper is open for questions. Yeah, Lucas. <laughs> so I, have, I have two questions. Yes. But, um, the first one is I, I fail to understand. But first of all, it was a fantastic talk. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I fail to understand somehow. I don't have a microscopic picture of what is happening here. Yeah. So I have this electron, and you explained, okay, all these Landau levels and stuff. And now I have a fluctuating vacuum field. What, what does this fluctuating yeah. vacuum field do to the electron? Yeah, I mean, you didn't understand because I didn't explain. <laughs> this is a bit more complicated than what I said. And of course, I mean, we have a theory for that. But this involves really a number of uh, virtual processes that in our case, so you have to consider the fact that we are in an ultra strongly coupled system. So it means that the interaction between light and matter is very high to the point to modify already the ground state of the system. In these specific classes of system, what we have is that the anti-resonant terms, so the possibility of having at the same time an excitation of one electron and one photon is, is, is possible and is actually part of the Hamiltonian of the system. Plus, in this theory that we consider to be the relevant one, we also consider the role of disordered Landau levels. So what happens, the, the, the basic process that happens is the fact that we can basically move from one state to another one which, has the, which is, let's say, at the same energy but with a different disorder state through an intermediate step which is a virtual 
absorption of um, a vacuum photon, and then this photon gets also immediately released. So it's basically a, a mediated process where this virtual particle is mediating like uh, two states at the same energy but with different disorder index. And we did numerical simulations on this, and it's basically, it's also possible to write uh, like a Fermi uh, element for, for this process, and you see that this will depend, for example, on the interaction strength so and then also with the, the, with the cavity, you're ex uh, essentially enhancing the density of these optical yes. states in this particular frequency yes. regime. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. The, the theory is made by Cristiano Ciuti from, uh, from Paris. Yes. So it's, uh, and that's why it's right? <laughs> no, it's just to make sure that, no, no, just to, make, to give credit it's, it's to, a the disclaimer proper, or <laughs> to give the proper credit to the person who did it. It's not like we did it ourselves, that's all. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah. So, so I, um, first off, I, I need to also say that it's a very good talk, but uh, your, your, the whole experiment is about destroying an effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> there are so many ways to destroy an effect. Um, what, what kind of due diligence did you do to... Um, yeah. So, so for example, uh, you, you you bring your your metal uh, tip from above. You might have changed the uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. magnetic flux. You've uh, you've induced a current. You've warmed up the system. You've destroyed the effect. Yeah. So I mean, actually, I, the the amount of um, experimental proofs I showed you is just a part. So we did we did, for example, this experiment where um, in order to confirm the dependence on the energy. Pen so what what we did in the archive paper is basically starting from this formula and then checking all the dependence on the different parameter. So for example, in order to test the dependence on the coupling strength, what we did was basically measuring uh, many all bars at the same time, sharing source and drain with the same temperature and then check whether this was actually scaling with the coupling of the system. And we show that this is the case for a number of filling factors. Then another proof that we tried to do was actually yeah, doing this as a self-reference experiment where we say, okay, we rotate the magnetic field, so the sample in the magnetic field, and in that case, what we do is basically changing the ratio between the Zeeman energy and the cyclotron energy. And then we look at what happens, and if we can go back into a situation which is closer to the perfect quantization, okay? Because we move basically the distance, the energy penalty of this process, so the distance from the Fermi level to the position of the band, okay? And what we see is this, that as a function of angle, actually you see the dark is starting from zero, and the, the light, so the yellow, is actually the case where we have an angle of 50 degrees. So increasing uh, the, the ratio of so the, the Zeeman gap, we see that we move from a regime where the, well, you can read it here. This is the difference between the resistance we measure and the quantized resistance. We are basically going back towards the quantized value, the perfect quantized value. So actually, we have a set, a collection of experiments. Of course, what we did is filtering, we, we make sure, but in a way, our strategy in order to prove why this effect is coming really from interaction with light or with vacuum fields is we have some sort of a theoretical guideline and then we try to find many orthogonal proofs so that if it was an artifact, well, it would have been like a different artifact every time. So that's why we say, okay, this is coming from that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any other question? Yeah. Um, it's more a curiosity about um, uh, can you or do you know can you engineer your vacuum fluctuations or to <coughs> change the, this effect? 
the first thing which comes to my mind is like, can you squeeze these fluctuations yeah. out? Please, like, affect the yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I mean, actually, actually yes, it's, it's something we're working on because we also suspect <laughs> that the like um, there, there could be a difference in this effect whether we are talking about homogeneous field and non-homogeneous field. So we are also studying cavities where we can produce local hotspots to see whether this is the case. Of course, also squeeze, squeeze states is a good proposition. In a way, we are, let's say, we are deciding now like where to bring uh, our platform. And, yeah. And of course, I mean, the next step is, as you say, is moving from destroying a nice uh, quantization to maybe build new states using, yeah. because it's another interaction. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah. I guess a follow-up question would be, can you, can you do the opposite Purcell effect, decreasing the density of states and, and getting better quantization? But yeah, like making that, that 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 is something like in in a way, if you were able to create a band gap, like a band gap uh, material, that 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 could be something. In a way, it's I'd say uh, for us, this is a com since those are planar meta materials, is a convenient also experimental uh, way of uh, <laughs> realizing the system. But in principle, yeah, I, I mean, I, I personally don't don't see a limitation. I think is actually one of the interesting questions about this. I hate cut off the discussion, but I think we unfortunately need to do that but very much. Thank you for all the questions. And thank, thank you for the Thank you. Thank you. And we restart at 10 past. We've got seven minutes to go outside, talk to each other.